We are really excited. We've been working on this project to, um, to um, do the Rhode Island LGBTQ plus community archive for several years now. So um, this all happened because about five years ago or so, a little bit more, we started getting a lot more questions in our, our special collections related to queer history in the state. And we just realized, my colleagues and I realized that we had a few materials, but not all that many. Um, and so we started looking around at what our colleagues at other libraries and archives had and trying to identify resources that we could send people to. And so we put together a research guide. Um, and if you are in another library or institution that has materials, please let us know so we can make sure we add that to our research guide. But we realized that there was nobody sort of intentionally collecting LGBTQ history for our state. And we realized as a public library with our mission to really be supporting community archives work, that that was something that we could offer. So we were really excited to start putting together this plan. We pulled together a advisory group um, that uh, started working about two years ago. Um, the advisory group includes members um, from the LGBTQ plus community and we'll show you their names in just a moment so you know who they are. Um, but they have been instrumental in helping us think through exactly what this will look like. So our intention is that this really is a community archive project. So that we at PPL are not gatekeeping it, we're just facilitating it, we're hosting it, we're making it accessible to researchers. But what gets collected, how it gets described, how it's made accessible and to whom, all of that is really driven from these conversations we have with our advisory board who are really highly participative. And so we really would love to hear from you about what it is you'd like to see. Um, so really our goal is um, to collect the social, cultural and political history of LGBTQ plus people in Rhode Island. And that could go back as far as the history of the state really, or the colony, right? Because um, queer people have always been here. It's just making sure that their stories are uncovered and told. So um, some of that gets a little complicated when you're looking at the past and trying to say like, well, people didn't use necessarily the terms to identify themselves that we use now. How would we understand that history? How do we look at the gaps in historical knowledge and how can we sort of tell those stories? Um, but also it's being really proactive about collecting contemporary history. So while people are still alive um, and have experienced, lived experience that they can help us tell those stories. Um, so it's really looking both at the past, what's, what's available to be collected, but also thinking about what can we collect now? Um, and that really has come, you know, I think really visible to the community in the past several years as some of the original folks who were involved in the 76 Pride Parade have passed on and, you know, trying to ensure that we get some of those memories captured um, has been really important. So, um, here is our list of community advisory members. I'm sure if you're familiar with Rhode Island, you recognize at least one or two people on this list. Um, the fantastic thing about this list is it includes people as young as in their early 20s and as old as in their late 70s. It includes people from a wide variety of ethnic and racial backgrounds. It includes people from all different kinds of ways of identifying themselves in terms of gender and sexual identity. Um, and also people who have held cultural heritage or history collecting experience and some people who have experience as activists and organizers and other um, and uh, creative work, things like that. So we really tried to pull together a group of people who could think about this community archive from a lot of different angles um, to sort of bring a lot of different expertise to the table. And it has been a fantastic group of people to work with. Um, and I have to say during COVID, a real joy to be working on this pro project with them. So. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of oral history recordings that came in in the past year. Um, these are just short clips from much longer oral history recordings. They're, we're hoping to have them fully online by the end of the summer. We're working on some technical issues on our digital repository and to make that happen. Um, but we have a collection of oral histories that were coordinated by Dr. Virginia Thomas, who um, was a scholar at Brown and has now moved on from Rhode Island, but um, has transitioned her oral history project to PPL's care. Um, and so we'll do a couple of clips just to give you a sense of the kinds of um, recordings we have. Uh, Virginia's work really focused on so social justice and civil rights, people working within that framework. 
Um, so the first little clip we've got is from Rodney Davis, who is a very long time um, organizer for Rhode Island Pride. And I understand newly established Rhode Island Pride board member again, which I think is really exciting. Um, so actually I'm hoping I might need to stop sharing really quickly and make sure I reshare with the volume. Hold on, let me try that again. Okay. So once I press play, if somebody can just give me a, maybe um, Alex, if you can give me a thumbs up that you can hear it. <laughs> if I actually sleep with a person, I could contract HIV. Am I okay with that? And how can I protect myself? And if I did become HIV positive, how would I live my life? Um, to which HIV in time was not the issue. There's far more deadlier issues in our community than HIV. You know, systemic racism because of systems in place are that much more destructive to our community. And I had to address that because there were things in my community that didn't look like me. You know, I was one of the only out leaders of color. There was like a handful of us, and then just like everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, short clip for a much longer interview from Rodney that is fantastic. Um, talks a lot about um, both the history of Rhode Island Pride, as well as um, his experience um, growing up in Newport and um, living in Rhode Island as a gay man. The next interview clip is from Billy Menser Ackerley, who um, has was a participant in the very first Pride Parade in Rhode Island in 1976 and every single parade since. Um, uh, this was part of a um, great oral history recording where he talks quite a bit about um, the sort of the culture of the 1970s in Rhode Island, how a lot of um, gay organizing happened and who was instrumental in making that happen. This particular clip is really focused on how the first Pride Parade happened in 1976. So um, you'll hear basically there was, there needed to be a legal case to ensure that people could have a parade. And that's what he's gonna talk about. This is a slightly longer clip, but um, it's a pretty interesting story. And given that we're coming right up on on the Pride Parade in a couple of weeks, thought it would be fun to share. In, in Rhode Island to, um, because a lot of other cities were already celebrating uh, Pride, uh, such as Boston and New York City and um, San Francisco and um, different other, Washington DC, different other places. And so um, it was the bicentennial year, 1976. And, um, we wanted to be part of the bicentennial celebration. And um, a man who was in charge of the bicentennial celebration, um, Patrick Conley, his name was, um, did not want us part of the celebration. And um, so what happened was uh, we had to get, go to court and um, Stephen Fortunato, who was involved with uh, the um, American Civil Liberties Union, um, he, he he took the case. And um, he was a straight man, but he was for human rights for all people. <clears throat> and, and because of this, what happened was he took harassment. Um, his house was egged. Um, you know, they were yelling queer and faggot at him, and he wasn't. But because he, he dared to, st to, to stick up for us, um, and, you know, later on in life, he became a judge. I believe he's right. He's retired right now, but um, um, he's retired. And um, uh, some years ago, he marched in the, the Gay Pride Parade um, as a grand marshal with his uh, granddaughter. I think it was his granddaughter. And it was so strange to see him. Uh, but I, I was so happy to see him. Um, but anyways, um, uh, so Joseph Gilbert went to court. And he went with um, uh, Ray LaRiviere, who actually was, was my partner. And he went with, he took along um, um, Bell Pellegrino. Because they wanted to have a woman represented also. And, um, and a man, and, and so there was a court case, and um, 
they filed for they filed first for a parade permit and they were denied, and that's when they took it to court. And um, I wasn't there. I, I mean, I was part of the community, but I was not the one who went to court. And um, so finally, um, a day or so before the parade, they uh, Judge Patine, who was um, the judge at the time in Rhode Island, um, he was high up there. Um, <clears throat> he, oh, he must have heard the case. And um, and what happened was. He, they gave the uh, permit to the, to us to be able to march. Well, um, they were forced to. And um, the uh, police chief, whose name, last name was McQueenie, um, he was furious about it because he didn't want Providence to be uh, known as a city that, uh, that let out the, the gay people, the queers in Rhode Island, you know, um, um, so, so the rest of that oral history interview is amazing. Um, Billy talks a lot about what it was like to actually march in the parade, um, what that experience felt like, um, you know, both from somebody who was um, involved in organizing it, but also like on the street, what the energy felt like. Um, so really amazing interview to hear in its full length. Um, and the next, it, clip I've got is from an oral history um, with Reverend Dr. Gwendolyn Howard, who has been working in civil rights um, for the LGBTQ community in Rhode Island for decades um, and has been working specifically on issues related to trans rights. Um, and so in this clip, um, Dr. Howard is talking about, um, it's sort of coming on the heels of talking about what their work was like in the 1980s when they were holding these sort of community forums about what, what being transgender meant because it was sort of a term that people weren't as familiar with at the time. Um, so you'll hear first the voice of uh, Virginia who's asking a sort of framing question. Um, and this is a great clip because it talks, it gives you a sense of how these interviews both, they tell a history, history and a historical story, but they also bring up issues around um, language and how that ch has changed over time and things like that. So you were basically engaged in a lot of consciousness raising around um, transgender um, rights and experience and um, kind of creating a culture shift around. Trying to do that, yeah. Yeah. I, I, used, to, I used to joke, there, there's a word we don't use anymore. It's one of those insulting words. Um, and it's, it's difficult for me. I have trouble with all of these words having lived long enough. Um, I still, I use the word queer, for example, and it's still, there's part of me that just winces because I can remember being beaten up as a kid, being called queer. So I recognize the value of it and I still, part of me is just, don't, don't say that. Well, today the, the word tranny is something you do not say. It's considered extremely insulting and inappropriate. 20, 30 years ago, that's what we called ourselves. <laughs> And I mean, in, you know, around 2000, I was, I was wanting to make t-shirts that said, I'm everybody's favorite tranny because I'm everybody's <laughs> first tranny. So <laughs> only half joking, <laughs> but we don't use that word for good reason. Yeah. So you were, so you get kind of a sense that there's a real, um, the, the oral histories in particular, I think hold so many stories. Um, and these are just a few. So we're excited once they go up online and we'll make sure that we spread the word about that. An example, um, quickly before I go off this screen into the live camera, I wanted to make sure you all had my contact information um, because we're gonna share to a live camera feed in a minute. Um, so really with this collection, the key thing that we're looking for is to let people know we're collecting, um, right? So you may not have materials, but you may, may know somebody who does introduce us to people or people who you think we need to be talking to. So if you were to say, you know, I think you need to, you really need to get the input of so-and-so in our community. They have stories that need to be told or you need their input on what the archive looks like and how it works. We would love to talk to people about that. You could donate materials. You could participate in an oral history interview yourself or nominate somebody else to do so. 
Um, so please just take a note of my contact information. We would love to talk further with you about that. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and it's just gonna take me a moment to transfer over to the other camera. So maybe I'll open it up if there's anybody who has questions, Erica, and you wanna, or comments from the chat that you wanna share. Oh, here is a question. Can you hear me, Kate? I can, yep. Great. This is from the Rhode Island Historical Society. Do individuals have the ability to access the materials in the LGBTQ plus archives from their homes? I know our staff will love to be able to read publications such as the Providence Phoenix and Headmaster Magazine. Oh, that's a great question. So we don't have things digitized yet, but that is in the plan. Um, so, um, we do have, and that actually that brings up some great uh, points about other publications. So we do have a full run, of, well, minus some of the late 1980s of um, the Providence New Paper, Nice Paper and the Phoenix. Um, and we do have a subscription to Headmaster. So I believe we have all the issues there. Um, and we have a full run of Options Magazine. They just, we'll show you a couple of examples of that. They just shared that with us um, in the past year. So those are materials we can make available. Right now, they're not digitally available, but we're hoping that they will be soon. Um, you know, as we're getting materials in, we're sort of both um, getting them organized in a way that they're sort of just open to researchers in general, but then also um, digitization will be happening in the future. Um, and I will note, um, I'll actually note it in one of the collections we're gonna show, um, RIHS has some fantastic video footage um, that I think they're working on out of their film archive, um, trying to identify related to um, pride parades and other events. So it's well worth not, you know, we're not the only person collecting. There are other places that have things. And, and that's part of our goal is to identify what those materials are so that we can refer people to them. Okay, so I'm gonna start off the live feed. I'm hoping you all can see this um, memoir, memoir of Jemima Wilkinson. Um, so otherwise known as public universal friend. So this is one of the items that I think kind of tells that story of how do we identify people in the past, right? Um, where they're not identifying themselves in language that maybe we would utilize now. Um, this is a fascinating story. Um, Jemima Wilkinson was born in the late 18th century in Rhode Island in a Quaker family. Um, and at, they, they actually, they, their family sort of um, at some point held a few views that kind of got them pushed out of their particular meeting house. Um, and in 1776, Jemima Wilkinson had a fever. It's unclear what her illness was, but she did go into a fever for about a week, um, unconscious. And when she was recovered from her illness, um, woke up and said, I've had a holy vision and I'm no longer male or female and I'm to be known forward as public universal friend. And so this fascinating story of somebody who's gender non-binary in 1776. Um, and what's really interesting is when you look at contemporary sort of descriptions about public universal friend, um, they're sort of viewed as an eccentric character, but not threatening in any way. Nobody seems particularly worried about them, just they're, they're quite eccentric. Um, public universal friend ended up um, starting sort of a religious community um, called the Universal Friends. Um, they started first at a farm in Southern Rhode Island. Um, they had a benefactor who allowed them and their followers to live on this farm. Um, it was very similar in some ways to the sort of um, standard parts of Quaker faith with some exceptions um, that included um, lifelong chastity and also um, most of the female followers dressed as men. So sort of this really interesting kind of um, take on sexuality and gender. At a certain point, um, they, the community purchased land in upstate New York. And the story goes that um, Public Universal Friends led this sort of troop of community members on a white horse at the front of the sort of parade of followers on a white horse out to Western New York. 
Um, the story gets a little weird by the end of their life because they um, essentially are a messianic figure for followers in their religious community. There's some potential issues around sort of skimming, financially skimming from their followers. So it's, it becomes sort of a strange cult history. Um, but it is a really fascinating story, I think, of somebody in the 18th century who is really pushing what we think of as what would have been, we, why, I think we assume there are really strict gender norms at that time. But in fact, I think it's a lot more fluid than probably any of us maybe realize. Um, so really fascinating story. And these are the kinds of stories that I think we're hoping to kind of uncover, um, which again, it's those sort of ideas of maybe people who wouldn't identify with terms or maybe there just wasn't at the time even still the same understanding of um, gender and sexual relationships that we have now. So identifying what those, might, those stories might be. Um, really worth researching Public Universal Friend Online. Fascinating story. So I'm gonna show you, this is one of my favorite photographs in our recent acquisitions. So this is a photograph of Francis Renault. Francis Renault was a um, very famous nationally and internationally to some acclaim um, female impersonator from the 1920s really up through the 1940s was the primary part of their career. Um, Francis Renault was their stage name. They were born Anthony Oriema in Naples, Italy. And when Anthony was eight, the Oriema family moved to Providence, Rhode Island as part of the um, you know, Italian immigrant history of our city. Um, Anthony's father worked in the jewelry district in downtown Providence. And a, as early as the 19 teens, so probably around 1916, 17, um, Anthony was performing as Oriema in Providence Vaudeville. So in Providence theaters downtown, um, doing an act that included, um, they were a very well regarded soprano singer um, and also doing female impersonation. They moved to New York and changed their stage name to Francis Renault, performed under Francis Renault for the rest of their career. Um, and one of the things they were really well known for, especially during the depression era, was these fantastic costumes. Um, this photograph I think is really an amazing example of these costumes. Um, that headpiece looks like it is incredibly heavy and um, just absolutely over the top with the Afghan hounds. Um, but one of the things they would advertise in the newspapers when Francis Renault was performing was that their really extravagant wardrobe would be on display in the theater foyer for guests to take a look at. And it was advertised as, you know, worth $5,000, which at the time, you know, at the time was an exorbitant amount of money during the depression, um, especially on, to spend on clothing. So um, really interesting story that sort of has its roots in Rhode Island and Rhode Island theater performance. Um, but with this sort of national, um, national reputation. So this is just such an over the top costume, it's my favorite. So I mentioned one of the collections that we recently took in was a full run of Options Magazine. So um, it actually goes back to 1983, um, but here's a couple of examples of sort of how the format changed over time. So early on, it was just a four pager, really like on mimeograph sheets, um, mailer, you know, but what's fascinating about it going for researchers who might be interested is that it the articles really do go into um, both social and cultural events happening, but a lot of political and, and activist activity. So um, it's giving a lot of really interesting detail in this particular case, um, 1986, talking about um, nursing, a, a nurse's involvement in Project AIDS, which is now AIDS Project Rhode Island, whose records we recently received. Um, and talking specifically about how, you know, concerns at the time that there was no sort of um, 
organized way for caregiving for people who were suffering from HIV and AIDS. So it really like that caregiving effort was coming out of a group of public health volunteers, um, as well as from within the LGBTQ community themselves, raising funds, doing the caregiving. Um, so this article kind of goes into much greater detail about that and how somebody could get trained to be a volunteer with the project. Um, within a year, so here's 1987, you can see the format gets a little bit more robust. So um, you can see this is, I think it's about an eight page mailer. The printing quality goes up. Um, you're getting a lot more advertisements. So even the advertisements themselves can be really interesting for researchers. What companies, what restaurants, what bars were supporting the queer community. Um, and the articles you'll end up seeing um, end up having a lot of, let me just pull this up a little bit, um, a lot of names that as you learn more about the history, you recognize the names. Um, and in a minute, you're gonna see that actual photograph. Um, so options is sort of really a treasure trove, I think, if anybody's interested in doing sort of like really in-depth research. And, um, you know, they are still publishing. They've just moved to a digital format, but um, continuously publishing. You can see the paper just grows in breadth and depth over time, um, down to including calendar entries for events happening. Um, so in terms of thinking about um, building a timeline for Rhode Island history, options is really key for that. And I'm going to show you from a couple of collections we've recently received. So um, one of the collections we got recently, just a couple of weeks ago, from my new favorite person is Kim Deacon, um, the Kim Deacon Collection. Um, Kim owned the Kings and Queens Bar in Woonsocket from 1979 to 2002. Um, this is a fantastic photograph. This is Kim here. Um, and in it, she is celebrating the birthday of Rita Poe, who is here. Um, I think it was Rita's 80th birthday, if I remember the description correctly. Um, and Rita owned Kings and Queens before Kim took it over, but also owned several other gay bars in Woonsocket from the late 1940s onwards. So in terms of Rhode Island history, Rita is a key player. There's a fantastic oral history transcription available at the Rhode Island Historical Society where they interviewed Rita. Um, so highly recommend asking them to, to make that available. Um, it's a really good read. Um, and I can't wait to hear the audio. I think it's probably still on audio cassette, but in any case, um, the Kings and Queens bar is a really interesting story because um, at it's, you know, a gay bar, but Kim really also utilized the, um, the bar as a way to create social spaces beyond just as a nightclub and bar. So there was, she host, helped host a softball league, a bowling league, a darts league, movie nights, biannual picnics at Lincoln Park, um, touch football games, um, new, you know, in addition to the, the events happening regularly at the bar, which would have included Halloween and New Year's Eve. So I'll show you a couple of photos of, of that. Um, some of the earliest Imperial Court performances um, and events happened at Kings and Queens in the early 80s. So really interesting place and also sort of a really, because it's Woonsocket, this really interesting connection for both, um, you know, people in, coming from Providence, to the bar, but also from Worcester, um, from other parts of Massachusetts. So you're sort of getting a, a regional impact. Um, so let me show you a few more photographs from that collection. So this photograph is of a performer named Ricky Raquel, who performed, um, this is circa 1974, who performed at a bar called Coffee's on Route 146 in Rhode Island. Um, and as I understand it, if, if you all know different, please pitch in. But as I understand it, Coffee's was not a gay bar, but had a standing Saturday drag night um, for a long time, apparently in the 70s and into the 80s. So um, Ricky Raquel, I think, was a long, per long time performer there. I actually don't know um, what name, you know, they maybe went, uh, went with outside of drag. So if anybody knows that, that would be great information as well. Um, I am really into this Dolly Parton style 
1970s wig. <laughs> Fantastically huge. Um, we do have a lot of interest actually in um, drag history. That's been coming up a lot. Um, so this, let me zoom in. This is a smaller image. Um, the note on this photograph mentions that it was an event called Sweet Illusion at the Kings and Queens. Um, and it said it was just before the Imperial Court. So this is one where actually we don't know the names of the individuals in the photograph. So this would be kind of a future project, which we'd love to do as we digitize, is to get community involvement in helping identify who people are. Um, I'm imagining they're doing some sort of dance line. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> Then there's just basic photographs of what life at the bar was like. So this is 1983. Um, I find this to be really sentimental, this photograph, right? This idea that just being able to dance with somebody of the same sex in a space was really revolutionary, was really risky in some places. Um, and this idea that just being able to have a, a picture of showing just dancing, um, right? Is, is something that is somewhat unusual. We've got a few other pictures like that. So this is a New Year's Eve celebration. So, you know, we talked a lot with Kim about like, well, what kind, some of these pictures, like you, it's hard to tell what's going on or you can't tell what's happening. Well, what you can tell is it's a party. What you can tell is that it's people having fun and celebrating with each other, right? And in a space where people don't feel like, they're letting loose, right? And that's an important story to be told. Lots more pictures in the collection of the bar itself. Um, it also includes a lot of the events that Kings and Queens were, was a part of. So for example, here are pictures of the Kings and Queens bar um, float from the 1987 Pride Parade. So again, um, you know, Kim might be able to identify some of the individuals in this picture, but we would love community help as we digitize to identify even more of them. Um, you know, it's also interesting, I think, when you're looking at the history of gay rights where you're sort of noticing things like the pink triangle flag, which maybe you wouldn't see at the Pride Parade now, um, but um, I think give you also a really good sense of sort of how people, what it was, how people were identifying themselves. What, what did that look like graphically? What did that look like through protest signs? Um, so Kim's collection is a treasure trove. Not only that, Kim is an absolute joy to talk to. I think we need to have her record some of her stories um, because she is the world's best storyteller. <laughs> okay, so items from another recent donation. This was um, planned actually to come into us right before COVID hit. So it took a little while to get to us. But um, these are materials from the AIDS Project Rhode Island collection. And this collection goes back to 1985, um, maybe a little bit early on or a couple of items, um, but basically documents um, the work that AIDS Project Rhode Island has been doing to, sorry about the focusing, I'm not sure why, it, let me raise it up a little bit. The autofocus is going crazy. Um, but they've been working, you know, for their entire organizational history to raise um, to raise funds and awareness around safe sex activities, HIV and um, AIDS care. Some of the events that they regularly were a part of include um, the AIDS walk, the um, tours of the AIDS quilt, they did an annual dance event to raise money. Um, and so these are buttons, there's sort of this ephemera piece this is something that I think is personally really fun um, to, to come into the archives. So you get a couple of examples of of buttons over the years. And then again, a lot of this collection is a photograph collection, but also includes some materials related to the work of the organization itself. So here's a 1985, this is maybe um, the first or one of the earliest I found so far in their collection, uh, newsletters. So especially if you're really interested in reconstructing who are the, some uh, foundational members of doing that work, the history of people and organizing. Um, these newsletters are really important. I mentioned that we, in that options magazine, some of the pictures related to the Pride Parade for 1987. And interestingly enough, I didn't realize until I actually pulled these today, but um, both of these original photos were reproduced in that options magazine. So 
sort of nice to see that we actually have both of the originals as well. Um, so again, you'll see uh, this would have been 1987. There are um, photographs. These are from 1993 from the AIDS quilt. This was actually when the quilt, it was doing a national tour and it was in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, but you can see the um, Rhode Island chapter for the Names Project. And I believe in this case, there's a number of photographs of it that are a little bit more detailed, that this is um, the Rhode Island chapter actually with um, parts of the quilt that represent Rhode Island um, individuals who died from AIDS. So um, really important story to be told from a for, by APRI. And um, interestingly enough, the Kim Deacon collection also includes, um, for example, they had done memorials um, and saved photographs of longtime customers of the bar who had died of AIDS in the 80s and 90s. So I think those kinds of collections sort of working in context with one another will be really interesting for researchers. And lastly, um, here's an example of one of their dance invitations. So 2001 to me doesn't feel that long ago, but it is 20 years ago. <laughs> um, some of these performers, most Rhode Islanders should know um, from the drag scene. Um, you know, and what's interesting I think about the APRI collection is um, you know, the awareness that it was actually a lot of drag queen performances, which was rate, which were doing massive amounts of fundraising, whether that was through the Imperial Court itself or other individual events, um, that the fundraising happening for AIDS awareness work really was centered um, coming from the drag community. And so that's a really important story I think to be told and that kind of gets told both through things like this that are just invitations to events, but also through photographs, um, and, and some of the planning documentation as well. There are some great photographs of um, some of the performers that we would love to, to share. Um, and then I'll show a couple of items that are more contemporary history. So one of the things that's important to note is that civil rights work is still happening as we speak, right? Um, we got, this is a relatively small collection, but a really great one um, from um, Trip Evans and his husband Edward Cabral, who both were involved with Mary or Marriage Equality Rhode Island. So um, Trip donated some materials related to their work um, with Mary, specifically um, in this case, this is a group of people who were um, who were at the Rhode Island State House rally in 2009 in the top here. So um, we don't actually have a lot of materials related to Mary. So if that's something that people were involved in, we would love for that to be represented more fully in the collection. Um, Tripp and Ed also donated these photographs that show them actually protesting with these protest signs and they also donated the signs. So they still held on to these um, and there is sort of a further photo that af after Rhode Island actually does pass marriage equality, they sort of edit the sign, right? And so you see it kind of, um, a, a later version of it. And so having that connection between both the photographic representation, but also the physical representation of a protest sign, I think is really powerful. Um, another example of ephemera that came from Trip, um, and this was a Rhode Island artist, but neither of us could remember who the printer was. So if anybody remembers who made these posters and t-shirts, we would love to make sure that gets documented. Um, so a fantastic protest, protest image. Um, I think, uh, you know, in this case, it's a t-shirt, but it was also printed as a poster. Um, MJ, if you're on here, you may actually know who printed that. Um, so again, things like that, which are kind of much more ephemeral, um, you know, we would love to sort of make sure are represented. Um, and thinking of protest work and more contemporary history, we also are taking in things that are happening, very contemporary history. So um, this was a sign that was printed um, at AS220 by Stages of Freedom for the Black Lives Matter protests um, and marches last summer. Um, and Stages of Freedom was kind enough to set some aside for us to make sure that they got donated to our collection as well. 
So we're really sort of thinking about both what happened in the past, but also what's happening right now and how do we make sure that we're actively collecting. Um, and so I'm gonna open it up for questions um, or ideas, suggestions, comments. Um, it's been a really fun project to be involved in and people have been generous and kind and really lovely. Um, and so it's been really joyful. That was fabulous. Thanks. Thanks. It's nice to see you, Jody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was just fabulous. Right. Any questions, Jody? anyone? Oh. I was going to say, Jody's on our advisory board, so um, been really involved in this process and helping us think it through. MJ asks, is there a general criteria or wish list that we can share? Ah, uh, so um, I don't, I think the criteria is that it is representative of somebody's lived experience, ideally. Um, so, you know, we would certainly not turn our nose up at like, you know, a state report or um, something like that, but really thinking about the work of, or, or the lived experience of people on the ground um, versus maybe like, you know, what we wouldn't take in legislative records anyway, those would be at the state archives or library. But, um, you know, I think, thinking of things that really represent um, what it's like to live in Rhode Island and how that informs what it's like to be LGBTQ plus in Rhode Island. Um, so things, you know, we would be maybe less interested in would be things that represent the story of other states. Um, we would be less interested in the, the records that it's like, you know, I'm trying to think the business records of somebody who happens to be gay, but don't necessarily tell the story of what it's like to have been gay in Rhode Island, right? So it's really thinking about um, something that informs what that lived experience is like. Um, that being said, you know, we're starting with not a lot in terms of what libraries and archives have in general. So the idea that like a flyer for an event or a postcard from a party that you attended, um, that's sitting in a desk drawer somewhere literally might be the only place that that event was recorded. And so that one poster or that one postcard then becomes really important from a historical artifact perspective. Um, we also do collect creative works including that are paper-based, including zines and comics. So MJ, um, I, you know, knowing that you asked the question, making sure <laughs> that that gets brought up, um, but thinking about, um, you know, sort of, for example, somebody's pho photography project, or um, you know, it doesn't have to be sort of, I think people maybe, if you have questions, the best thing to do is to reach out and ask and, and see if we would be interested. I will say there is one, one organization I've been trying to find a lead on, and that is the Door War Bookstore. Um, and so that's a tricky one because um, as a, uh, leftist bookstore for a long time in Providence. It was cooperatively owned. And so the tricky thing about that is because it was a co-op, it's unclear really who maybe would have held materials about how that organization actually ran. Um, so any leads on the Door War bookstore would be great. Cody says, I reached out to both folks who work at there and no luck, who worked there with no luck. Yeah, we've had a, we've had a, we've been able to sort of cobble together a list of people who were involved in the Door War bookstore, but nobody seems to have held on to much material about it. And then Matthew shared the link to Lady Fingers Letterpress. Oh, uh, was was that who did the the um, blows t the t shirt design? Um, okay, I know Lady Fingers, so I'll I'll check with them. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, really, if um, you all have ideas about who we should be talking to, want to introduce us to people, have ideas about programming that you would like to see happen in the upcoming year, um, you know, we are really game to get more input. Um, so thanks so much for being interested. <laughs> Kate, thank you so much again for this yeah. terrific virtual tour of this truly amazing archive. And thanks to all the advisory 
board committee folks who are here as well for, for making this possible and all of our partners who have donated so far. It's really exciting. Um, I think that concludes this tour, but thank you all for being with us and thank you all watching on Facebook as well. And as you know, it's PPL Give Day 2021. So I would be remiss if I didn't do a little plug for Give Day. We've raised almost $7,000 today thus far, all from community donations, which is unbelievable. Our goal is $15,000. Um, and we have an anonymous donor who is matching all donations up to $15,000 today. So it's a great day to make a gift. If you're able, we really appreciate it or to, to share the link to give as well. And I'll stick it in the chat here. Um, we really appreciate you all. Thank you so much. It's donations from folks like you that enable us to have wonderful archives like this and we really appreciate it. So thank you, thank you Kate again and happy Pride. Thanks all, bye.